so the main topic of this um, these lectures is symmetric matrix completion. Of course, that's a topic that um, has a very long, rich history and applications and connections with many different uh, areas. So my own interest in this topic started um, in the context of semi-definite optimization and um, and um, looking at methods for using matrix completion theory to speed up algorithms for sparse semi-definite optimization. So I'll try to explain that in the uh, introduction uh, before we start the actual lectures. So this uh, work also started with uh, Joachim Dahl. Uh, he was a postdoc at uh, UCLA uh, many years ago and then continued with um, uh, former and, and current PhD students. Uh, so a semi-definite optimization problem is um, a convex optimization problem that uh, is usually expressed in this form. So the variable is a symmetric uh, n by n matrix X. The inequality denotes that X must be positive semi-definite. And then we have a linear cost function, a linear uh, equality constraints uh, written here as the usual, usual in term, uh, using the usual trace inner product of symmetric matrices, uh, uh, inner products of X with coefficient matrices C or AI. Right? So it's a, uh, sometimes called linear programming with uh, conic constraints. Um, and this is a problem that has been um, studied for the last 20 years, um, mostly in three groups of applications. Uh, first, there are applications where uh, positive semi-definite constraints arise very uh, naturally, for example, in control and studying uh, stability using Lyapunov um, techniques. In statistics, obviously, if X is a covariance matrix, uh, it must be positive semi-definite. In uh, distance geometry problems, when X is uh, the gramming of a set of points, it must be positive semi-definite. So problems, applications like this, often lead to optimization problems with uh, positive semi-definite constraints. So the second group of applications may be the largest one in terms of uh, actual number of uh, semi-definite optimization problems solved in practice. Um, so semi-definite programming is used in convex modeling tools like CVX or uh, CVX Pi and uh, YALMIP and related uh, tools. And often these tools work by reducing a general convex optimization problem to a semi-definite optimization problem and then solving that and returning the answer to the uh, user. So their semi-definite optimization is used, but uh, it's not in a transparent way, but underlying these tools uh, are uh, solvers for semi-definite optimization. And then maybe the last uh, group of uh, applications is in uh, relaxations of uh, uh, quadratic, non-convex quadratic constraints, polynomial optimization problems. Um, so that was one of the uh, main applications from the early days of semi-definite programming, and it continues to be a very active uh, uh, field of uh, research. So the uh, connection with completion problems is that uh, in many of these applications, we encounter problems that are uh, quite large, but have sparse coefficients C and AI. And then one would hope to um, exploit sparsity in uh, much in the, as in the, in the same way as for linear programming, for example, if you have a very large a sparse uh, set of constraints, we know that um, uh, interior point methods can be implemented very efficiently. So here there's a complication in the case of a semi-definite optimization problem, because if the um, entries of the coefficient matrices A, I, and C are very sparse, then uh, the cost function and the equality constraints impose uh, only involve a small subsets of the variables in the matrix X, but X still must be in general a dense matrix to be feasible for the inequality constraint. So written like this uh, problem quickly leads to a very large scale problem because you have this N by N uh, dense uh, matrix variable. Um, so that sort of uh, motivated some techniques that exploit completion theory that I'll explain in a few slides, but maybe I can first give one application uh, that actually falls in this um, 
third uh, class of problems and that maybe explains the sparsity. Um, so this is a problem that has received a lot of attention in uh, electric engineering. It's a power flow distribution problem, uh, optimal power flow distribution problem. So it's a problem with uh, an optimization problem that's actually very non-convex. And here I just summarize the reason why it's non-convex and I give the uh, non-convex constraints. In addition to this, there are several convex constraints. So the variables, so it's a distribution network, the variables, are the voltages at each uh, node in the network. They're complex numbers, so you could also represent them as uh, in a complex plane as two vectors. And there's a complex power uh, in each uh, link of the network between nodes I and uh, J. These are also complex uh, numbers. And there are two actually constraints that make the problem uh, non-convex. One is that the these node voltages, these complex numbers, are uh, upper and lower bounded by limits. So the upper bound would be a, a simple convex constraint. The lower bound is a non-convex constraint. So in, uh, if you represent the VI as, you, as a vector in a complex plane, it would be a lower bound on the uh, Euclidean norm of uh, VI. Um, a second uh, constraint are the power balance equations. So for each uh, line in the network. The total power uh, entering the admittance of the line must be equal to the uh, complex power that's dissipated in the admittance. So that gives a nonlinear uh, quadratic equality constraint of this form. If you write in terms of real variables, it would be two uh, equality constraints that involve the square distance between these two vectors in the plane. But uh, in any case, it's a nonlinear uh, quadratic constraint. So a general technique that uh, also underlies a lot of uh, applications of semi-definite programming is to relax these uh, quadratic constraints by introducing a matrix variable. Uh, in this case, the real part of the V times V complex conjugate. And if you, uh, so the matrix with these elements, if you have these as extra variables in the problems, then these two uh, constraints actually become very simple, become uh, actually linear. So the bounds on the modulus of VI become simple upper and lower bounds on the diagonal elements of X. The bounds, uh, these equality constraints on the distances, squared distances become also linear in the original variables, and then the matrix X. Um, but all the non-convexity is now in this uh, added equality constraint that relates X to the original variables. So we obtain a relaxation if we uh, drop this constraint and replace it with a weaker constraint that just says that X is a positive semi-definite matrix. And then we uh, obtain a semi-definite optimization problem. So that's the technique that's been used in many recent uh, papers. Um, the, for the purpose of this talk, it's interesting to note that uh, the problem you obtain is very sparse in the sense that only a few entries in this positive semi-definite matrix X appear in the constraints. So the diagonal entries and then the uh, off-diagonal entries, uh, X, I, J, if there is a connection in the network between node I and node J. All the other entries are um, don't appear explicitly in the variable and their constraints. They only have to be um, in general non-zero to make the entire matrix positive semi-definite. Um, and then this is in general a relaxation. If X happens to be a rank two matrix, you actually have uh, found the exact uh, solution. And in general, you can use it as an approximate solution find a suboptimal solution. Uh, so that's one uh, sort of typical application in this last category. And it shows that the uh, sparsity often uh, arises in problems of this form. And there is an underlying uh, graph or network structure that makes the uh, uh, leads to this kind of sparsity. In um, 
so we're interested in uh, exploiting that kind of structure in a semi-definite optimization problem. And one uh, very interesting approach that connects it with the completion theory is to just reformulate this problem in a very uh, small but important way by writing it in this form. So in these two um, formulations of the problem are actually, uh, there are two differences. One is that in the original problem, the original SDP, X is a uh, dense matrix variable that can be very large for uh, if the dimensions are large. In the second problem, we restrict X to be a sparse matrix with the sparsity pattern of the constraints in the problem and the cost function in the problem. So all the coefficients here in the problem are assumed to be very sparse. They have a common sparsity pattern that we'll always denote by E in this talk. So in the first formulation, X is a dense matrix. Here, X is a sparse matrix with that sparsity pattern E. So I only use in X as variables, the entries that matter for the constraint and the cost function. So that makes X a much lower dimensional uh, optimization variable. And this doesn't have to be actually be uh, necessarily be a large uh, scale optimization problem. But in order to do that, I have to uh, repeat, uh, replace the uh, in inequality constraints by the constraint that X, the sparse matrix X must have a positive semi-definite completion. Uh, and then the question uh, in this formulation, so the benefit is we have a much smaller dimensional problem. It's still a conic optimization problem with linear constraints and uh, objective. But the question is how difficult is it to handle this uh, cone of uh, positive semi-definite completable matrices as compared to the original uh, simple uh, dense uh, positive semi-definite cone. And mm -hmm. that's where uh, the positive semi-definite completion uh, theory then uh, becomes very useful. Steven, can I ask yes. a quick question? Um, when you say a, a positive semi-definite completion, are we only allowed to uh, modify the zero entries um, of X? Yes. Or? Okay. And here it's the standard positive semi-definite completion, the uh, zeros in the matrix in the sparsity pattern can be replaced by uh, other elements to make it positive semi-definite. But I'll explain some of the uh, notation uh, in a few slides. Um, and there, of course, the, and so there have been several techniques uh, proposed or different approaches to exploit sparsity. Um, there's actually two that are very closely related to completion theory. The first one here would be to uh, look at the original problem and try to exploit sparsity as much as possible in the implementation of the general primal dual theory point methods. Uh, that's uh, typically not much related to completion problems. But two and three here are uh, very much related. In the first one, we try to implement an interior point method for uh, conic linear optimization, but over this cone of positive semi-definite completable matrices. Uh, so it has been solid since uh, around 2000, the first paper. The second approach is to use uh, completion theory for uh, the decomposition results that uh, we'll discuss for from matrix completion theory. And that's a general um, strategy that can be applied in combination with many types of um, optimization uh, methods. It has been used for interior point methods, but also for first order methods, splitting methods like the uh, alternating direction method of multipliers. Um, and they rely on the classical decomposition results for uh, sparse uh, matrix completion. So in this, uh, the three lectures we'll actually discuss in more details, two and three, and then the uh, underlying theory. Uh, and then the third topic I mentioned in the title is chordal graphs, and maybe that's uh, familiar to most people here. But uh, chordal graph theory have, of course, been studied in many disciplines, often under different names since the 1960s. Uh, maybe first in combinatorial optimization and actually underline many of the, uh, like Berge and Lovals uh, wrote the uh, 
introduce the topic and um, discuss the key results. So coral graphs are an important class of perfect graphs. And that means that there is a list of um, combinatorial optimization problems that are very difficult in general that become very easy for coral graphs. So for example, graph coloring, uh, finding all the clicks in the graph, um, the number of clicks in the graph are all very difficult in general, but for coral graphs can be solved by simple uh, greedy methods. Uh, and of those, maybe only the enumerating clicks is the will encounter or see why that's the case for coral graphs. In linear algebra, also very early from the 1960s, people noticed the connection with the, the uh, graph elimination and Cholesky factorization of sparse matrices. And then later in the 1980s, there was a series of very um, important papers on different types of matrix completion problems, positive semi-definite uh, Euclidean distance matrix completion, and so on, that uh, we'll also discuss. Uh, there are some applications in uh, database theory that I actually don't know much about. Um, in machine learning, it um, is important. Um, they're called actually decomposable graphs, usually in machine learning, in the study of graphical models and also uh, Euclidean distance matrices. And in just nonlinear optimization, they all also have been studied since the 1980s uh, when people uh, look at partial separability. Um, as a, an important type of structure in uh, large scale nonlinear optimization problems. And actually, the use in semi definite optimization is, uh, goes back to this uh, first paper in uh, 1970. So, for these uh, three lectures, uh, they'll um, more or less coincide with these three parts, although the first one, the third one, is actually the shortest. Uh, section. So in this lecture, I'll start with uh, maybe just reviewing the, diff the basic definition of chordal graphs and also some connections with uh, sparse matrix uh, algorithms from just sparse matrix uh, analysis. And then in the second part, which will be the main part, actually, we'll discuss the uh, uh, different results on matrix completion and then the uh, algorithms for solving them. And then we look at some of these applications that I mentioned in the introduction. So let's start with uh, the definition of the chordal graph. So I'll uh, first give the definition that I think is probably familiar to many people here. Then three representations of chordal graphs will be uh, very important. So the uh, uh, click trees, is one example. And then in the sparse matrix algorithms, numerical uh, algorithms, uh, people um, often use elimination trees and supernodal elimination trees, which are very related to click trees, but uh, a little different. And then um, we'll explain how we use it for, um, uh, in, for example, semi definite optimization. So first, some graph notation. So an indirected graph uh, is denoted the standard way by uh, vertices and a set of edges. Here, edges are uh, pairs of vertices because it's an indirected graph. Uh, the neighborhood is a set of uh, vertices adjacent to a vertex, um, excluding the vertex itself. So the neighborhood of A is uh, B, E, and C in this example. And then another um, thing I should mention is when I use the term click in this uh, talk, I usually, uh, I mean the maximal, a maximal complete subgraph. Uh, it's more common to use click for just uh, any complete subgraph. But here, um, even if I don't mention maximal explicitly, I usually mean the, uh, I mean the maximal complete subgraph. And of course, we're interested in uh, sparse matrices. And then the uh, graph, undirected graph, represents a sparsity pattern of a symmetric matrix. So the uh, vertices are the indices in the graph, row and column indices. The edges represent uh, possible non-zero positions. 
And more precisely, I should say that it's the absence of an edge that um, has the information. So if there's no edge between two vertices, it means that in that posi position, the uh, matrix must be zero. So the two five element and the five two element in this matrix must be zero. The other entries that are adjacent or the diagonal entries may or may not be zero. Um, so the, um, uh, we always use E for a sparsity pattern and this notation for sparse matrices of size N by N with sparsity pattern E. And then uh, I mentioned clicks as maximal complete uh, subgraph. So um, the, um, these correspond to maximal dense principal submatrices. So for example, this is a click in the graph. Uh, corresponds to a maximal dense uh, principal submatrix, and again, dense in quotes because it doesn't mean that the um, um, entries must be uh, non zero, right? They're allowed to be zero. Okay, so then a chordal graph is uh, defined like this it's an uh, undirected graph. That doesn't contain as a subgraph a cycle of length uh, greater or equal to four. So this is a non is a non chordal graph because it contains as a subgraph a cycle of length uh, four. If we add um, a chord, uh, so an edge between con uh, non consecutive um, vertices in the cycle, then it becomes uh, we destroy the cycle and it becomes a chordal graph. Uh, so other names are um, rigid circuit graph in some of the early papers, uh, triangulate, triangulated graphs because um, by, uh, the only cycles you can have are actually cycles of length three. Decomposable is a common name in machine learning. Um, there's some common examples or simple examples. Um, for example, K trees, um, um, and then uh, maybe we can skip this for now. But then we'll see later what uh, how common or how coral graphs actually uh, usually appear in our applications. Uh, and there are a few um, very classical results from the early papers on coral graphs that I'll mention here before we get to uh, click trees. So first one by uh, Dirac in one of the first papers on this is uh, in terms of minimal separators. So a subgraph of an uh, undirected graph is a minimal separator between two vertices uh, V and W. If uh, removing that subgraph results in a disconnected graph with V and W in separate and different uh, connected components. And it's a minimal, at least minimal for these two uh, specified uh, vertices. And then uh, early on, it was proved that chordal graphs are, um, can be characterized by the property that all minimal vertex separators are complete graphs. And uh, another result is that every minimal vertex separator is a subset of at least two uh, clicks. So that's something that we won't use very much in this talk, although it's implicitly uh, a property that is uh, important. Uh, so this is an example of a chordal graph. These would be all the uh, minimal vertex separators. Um, um, a second property that is uh, more directly relevant for later is in terms of simplicial vertices. So a vertex is simplicial if the neighborhood is a complete uh, subgraph. So it means actually also that a closed neighborhood, if you add a node itself, it becomes a click. And uh, in this uh, graph, we have three simplicial vertices, I, F, and A. And Dirac again proved that every choral graph uh, that's not complete 
has at least two non-adjacent simplicial vertices. So this example has three, but there are at least two in every uh, coral graph, unless it's complete and then there's only every vertex is, uh, um, but every non-complete has at least two. So uh, some of these properties will come back. So these are some of the early characterizations that will come back when we talk about uh, click trees. And click trees actually summarize many of these uh, properties in a very uh, nice uh, way. So a click tree is uh, defined like this. So here we have a, a coral graph. On the right, we have the, all the clicks in the graph and they're arranged in a tree. And this tree has uh, what's known as the an induced uh, subtree property. So that means that if we look in this click tree and we look for the clicks that contain a given vertex, for example, the vertex E, then the clicks that contain this given vertex, that's the induced subtree, induced by that uh, vertex, form a subtree in the click tree. So therefore we call it, and that's true for every vertex in the uh, graph on the left. And um, therefore it's called the induced uh, subtree property. And a uh, very important property of coral graphs is that they're exactly the graphs that have a click tree with this induced subtree property. And um, say something more about the uh, way that these uh, cliques are joined. Um, yeah, uh, so how he, do you get this graph on the Yeah, so we'll get to that uh, later actually, because because that's the uh, can be done very efficiently. Here I just showed the result of a click tree that has this property. And it's um, of course an important restriction on which tree we pick that uh, on this set of cliques. But you see uh, how this is done in practice. So how all the clicks are actually found or represented and then how they're uh, connected in this uh, click tree. Um, but this result simply says it's always possible and it actually is a very uh, uh, equivalent characterization of chordal graphs. And it's also abstractly on a high level, the reason why many computational problems with coral graphs become easy because it is, uh, they're solvable by greedy methods that really exploit this induced subtree property in different applications. Um, so the next uh, slides uh, don't really explain yet how this is uh, constructed, but uh, explain that this click tree with an induced subtree property actually summarizes many of the uh, structural properties that I mentioned in the previous uh, slides. Uh, suppose we pick a root of this tree, we just pick any of the click as uh, root and then we uh, represent it in the usual way as a rooted tree. Then if you have a, um, a root, then we can separate or partition every click in two sets. Um, they're indicated here as two rows. So the top row is always the intersection of the click with the parent in the click tree. And uh, we'll call that the separator of the click. So every click has a separator except the root in the click tree. And then the remainder uh, of the vertices and the uh, click are called the residual, click residuals. Uh, so that's a definition as possible if we have a click tree and we pick a root. And then from that structure, we get, um, and the induced subtree property, we get uh, a lot of interesting information about the uh, coral graph. For example, uh, because of the induced subtree property, one can show that these residuals, so the second row in every um, click, um, partition all the vertices in the graph. Because by the induced subtree property, a given vertex E can only be in a residual of uh, one click by the induced subtree property. It must be in the separators of the other clicks. So these residuals uh, partition the 
uh, vertices in the graph. And therefore, that gives, this gives a simple um, proof that a chordal graph has at most n clicks. In fact, n minus 1 if it's uh, connect, uh, connected. Um, because the uh, residual subsets of each click partition the, the entire vertex set. Um, then these click separators, so the um, first row in every click happen to be the minimal vertex separators that are defined. Um, so you can have at most n minus one of them. And then also uh, I mentioned or defined a simplicial vertex. A simplicial vertex from the click tree can be found as the vertices that belong to, uh, that don't belong to any click separator. For example, in this case, A, uh, F and I were the uh, simplicial vertices in the graph. Um, so this is one example of a tree representation of a chordal graph. Uh, it's not the only one, and we'll see uh, one or two more later. And in general, it's an example of a tree um, or a representation of an undirected graph as a tree intersection graph. And a tree intersection graph is defined uh, as follows. So we start with a tree T. We have a family of subtrees in the, in the tree that are indexed by some label V. And then the tree intersection graph uh, defined by this, um, this family of subtrees is a graph that has uh, these labels V or the subtrees, uh, RV in the um, this set of subtrees as its vertex set. And in the tree intersection graph, two vertices are adjacent if uh, those two subtrees intersect. And uh, another basic result on chordal graphs is that uh, tree intersections graphs are chordal. And that's actually if and only if every chordal graph can be represented as a tree intersection graph. And a click tree is uh, one way of doing this. In a click tree, uh, we are actually obtaining we're starting with a click tree and then obtain this chordal graph as a, a tree intersection graph. So we think of every vertex in this uh, graph on the right as representing a subtree in the uh, tree on the left. And in this case, it's the subtree uh, induced by that vertex. So each subtree induced by a vertex corresponds to a vertex in this graph on the right. And then two of those subtrees are um, adjacent if they intersect in the click tree. So that means that those vertices are uh, part of the same click and therefore uh, they're adjacent. So we could start with the click tree and then obtain this as a tree intersection, intersection graph of the click tree. Um, so that shows the one direction of this uh, result. And this is another example just to illustrate the definition. So this is a tree T. We define five subtrees. And then for these five subtrees, this would be the tree intersection graph. Every node in the represents one of these subtrees. And they're adjacent if they uh, intersect, right? For example, R1 and R2 have uh, B in common. Therefore, they're uh, adjacent. So three uh, representations, so representing the graph as a tree intersection graph can be done in different ways. We already mentioned click trees. In machine learning, people often call them junction trees. And then one difference of is that the uh, vertices of the uh, junction tree are complete subgraphs, but they're not necessarily maximal complete subgraphs, as in the click tree. In uh, sparse matrix algorithms, people often also use elimination trees that we'll discuss later. And also uh, closely related, but uh, different from click trees. So this um, finishes that part of the um, 
this lecture. Um, and then we get to um, a topic that's much closer to sparse uh, positive semi definite matrices. Um, and we'll show that uh, or see that chordal graphs are uh, exactly the graphs for which there exists a perfect elimination ordering. And that's defined uh, as follows. So if you have an undirected graph, we can order the vertices by just assigning uh, numbers to them. And we have an ordered uh, directed graph. Uh, we can represent it by just uh, writing the number next to each vertex, or we can represent them by uh, in an array like this. That could represent the sparsity pattern of a uh, symmetric matrix. So we put the vertices on the diagonal in the order that we uh, selected. And then the dots represent the uh, edges in the graph. So this has the advantage that it's uh, easy to find the um, uh, adjacent edges is uh, adjacent vertices to a given graph that uh, precede or follow it in the ordering. So for example, uh, we'll use this notation. So the vertex C, the uh, neighborhood of C is uh, the vertices uh, A, D, and E. But it's very easy to, in this graph, to see that A is uh, the vertex in the neighborhood that precedes it in the ordering and D and E follow it in the ordering. And we'll denote that by the um, a plus and a minus. So the neighborhood with a subscript a superscript plus is the higher or monotone neighborhood of vertices that are adjacent and follow V in the ordering. And uh, with a minus sign, it's the vertices in the neighborhood that uh, precede it. So that we can also define a higher and a lower degree. And then if we uh, include the vertex itself in the neighborhood and uh, we call that a closed uh, neighborhoods, we'll just use a notation call and row because in this array, they appear as a row and uh, the non zeros in a row or that call. Um, and then of course, we are interested in symmetric uh, sparsity patterns. So um, it means that after um, an ordering represents a symmetric reordering of the rows and columns in a matrix. So if you use uh, this ordering, for example, of a matrix, we obtain uh, a reordering, a symmetric reordering of the uh, sparse matrix. So a graph, uh, we can do this for every uh, disordering, for every undirected uh, graph. It's uh, an ordered undirected graph, so an undirected graph plus an ordering is called a monotone transitive or filled if it has the property that every uh, higher neighborhood of every graph induces a complete subgraph. Uh, so for example, in this vertex B, if you look at the edges uh, connected to B that follow it in the ordering, then they are uh, D, C, and E, and that's a complete subgraph. Or uh, another way to say this, if we have two vertices in this higher neighborhood, for example, D and C are adjacent to B and follow it in the ordering, then uh, D and C must be uh, adjacent themselves. So also D and E and C and E must be uh, adjacent. If that's true for every higher neighborhood, so for every column in this array, then the graph is called filled or uh, monotone transitive. And then uh, this gives us to our last um, characterization of coral grass, again from the 1960s, a very uh, important result that says that the graph is coral if and only if it has a perfect elimination ordering. Uh, it's related to some of these other uh, results that I mentioned. So it's related to the fact that every coral graph has a simplicial vertex, because if we just uh, want to pick the first vertex in the ordering, then that uh, 
course, the higher neighborhood is the neighborhood of the vertex. So for that first vertex, the vertex must be simplicial. And in a coral graph, you can find at least one uh, simplicial vertex. If it's not complete, we actually have uh, at least two by uh, Dirac, Dirac's result. And then we can combine it with a second um, important uh, but simple property of coral graphs. And that is that if a graph is coral, then every subgraph is also coral. So if you start with a simplicial vertex as a first vertex in the ordering, then remove that vertex and the remaining graph is still coral. So it again has a simplicial vertex and that way we can find a simplicial, a perfect elimination ordering. So in practice, there are many other algorithms that are actually more uh, faster than or more uh, efficient than the, uh, the simplicial elimination. So maybe the best known one is the maximum cardinality search by uh, Tariana Yanakakis. Has linear uh, complexity, linear in the size of the graph. Uh, it's guaranteed to find a perfect elimination ordering if the graph is coral. And for that reason, it's also a very uh, efficient test of the property of being coral. You can try to apply one of these algorithms. If it succeeds, it proves it's coral. If it doesn't find a perfect elimination ordering, then it proves that graph is not uh, coral. Uh, so maybe uh, we can go to this next point uh, and then finish for the first lecture. So the purpose of the next part is then to relate some of the uh, all the theory of chordal graphs and make it more uh, computational by relating it to algorithms in sparse linear algebra. There are people encounter or have studied structures that are uh, close related to click trees but um, uh, usually defined in terms of elimination trees or supernodal elimination trees and uh, can be manipulated and uh, constructed very efficiently. Um, so suppose we have a filled graph, so an ordered graph, undirected graph with an ordering. Then uh, we can define the elimination tree uh, like this. So the trees, the, the nodes and the tree are the uh, vertices in the graph. And the parent structure is defined like this. For every vertex in the graph, the parent in the elimination tree is the first vertex in that column. So the first um, uh, vertex that in the higher neighborhood of uh, the vertex that follows it. So the parent of A is B, the parent of uh, B is uh, D in this uh, ordered graph, the parent of uh, D is uh, C and so on. Right. So that's called an uh, elimination tree. Um, we see it's closely related to click trees, but one difference, of course, is that this only contains some of the information about the complete graph. It's not possible to get the complete graph by just looking at the elimination tree. But we get some uh, important information. Uh, obviously, we know from definition that uh, each parent is adjacent to the vertex. But from the um, perfect elimination property, we can say more. If you look at the vertices in a column, then all those uh, adjacent vertices must be on the path from the node to the root in the elimination tree. So the elements of the higher neighborhood of a vertex must be on the path somewhere between the vertex and its root. So by just looking at the elimination tree, we know that for this graph, uh, these three vertices, F, I, and H, are certainly not adjacent to A. For the other vertices, we cannot really uh, tell just by looking at the elimination tree, except of for the first one, of course. But we, D may is in this case not adjacent. Uh, C and E are. Um, so we get uh, some important information about the graph, but it's not really uh, complete. Right? 
we can actually uh, construct from it a graph that uh, a, a tree that would look very much like a click tree if we um, expand it. So this is the same elimination tree with the um, that I had here, A, B, and so on. The only difference is at the top of each block, I added the all the the entire higher neighborhood. So we can think of an elimination tree uh, and this information. Um, and then the monotone transitivity or the filled property of the um, perfect elimination means that every block in the first row is actually the intersection of this each node in the this expanded elimination tree and its parent. So it uh, means this we can have a kind of uh, induced subtree property. Um, each, uh, if you look at, uh, in other words, all the blocks in this expanded elimination tree that contain a given vertex E, then they uh, form an in, a subtree of this expanded elimination tree. And the subtree is exactly the um, uh, vertices in the original graph that contain that given vertex E in their uh, higher neighborhood. So that's another way of saying it's just the non-zeros in that row of the sparsity pattern. So the, uh, for if you pick a certain vertex and look at the vertices in that uh, row, then they form a, a subtree of this expanded elimination tree. So it's very much like an, uh, a click tree. The difference is that uh, these are not clicks. They're just, uh, we have one of these blocks for each um, um, uh, vertex in the graph. They're still complete subgraphs by the uh, uh, monotonicity. Uh, and they have this induced subtree property. And uh, for many purposes, it can be used instead of a click tree, but it may be more efficient to work, work with this or uh, construct it. Um, and then just to finish a few things, we can, um, the people in uh, sparse matrix algorithms have um, developed very uh, efficient methods for constructing elimination trees, uh, getting some important information from the elimination tree. So for example, uh, it turns out that um, it's quite easy to find all the clicks or maximal clicks from this elimination tree. And we actually don't need the full expanded elimination tree. It's sufficient to have the higher degrees of every vertex. So if I just know these numbers, the number of vertices in this uh, top row, I don't need to know the exact uh, elements of it, only the higher degree, then knowing the elimination tree and these higher degrees that I put next to each block here, there is a simple test to um, allows you to find the columns in the original pattern that define the clicks in the graph. Um, so um, the details don't really matter, but uh, they're indicated in this click tree I indicate those higher degrees uh, next to each vertex. And then there's a very simple test uh, for, uh, if you have that additional information to find the uh, vertices in the graph that uh, define the clicks in the graph. And they're called the representative vertices of each click. And here they're indicated by uh, squares. So in this case, A and the Vertices adjacent to A are uh, a click, B defines a click, uh, E, and so on. Uh, so that's one uh, nice result from uh, sparse linear algebra. Uh, and another one is that we can um, 
also get more information about, we can actually relate this uh, also to a click tree. Um, and that uh, brings us to the definition of a super node. So if we have the elimination tree with the additional information that we know the uh, higher degree of every uh, vertex, then I can find the representative vertices that are indicated by squares here. And the, uh, I can partition the vertices or the nodes in the elimination tree in different ways, but I can, for example, from for every vertex, look at the, every representative vertex, look at the nodes on the path between that vertex and the next higher representative vertex. And those are called super nodes. So for example, A, C, and D here is a super node. Um, B by itself then would be a super node. I could also have chosen B, C, and D, and then A would by itself be a super node. So it's, uh, the partition is, is not unique. Um, here L, M, N, P, Q would be a super node and so on. So I can partition the elimination tree or the nodes in the elimination tree like this. They're called uh, maximal super nodes. I can then uh, collapse or compress the elimination tree and, uh, by what's called a supernodal elimination tree that actually treats each of these super nodes as one node in the tree in sort of an obvious way. So A, C, D would be uh, a super node, then B would be a, a child of that super node in the super node elimination tree. Um, and then that's related to a click tree, because if I do the same as uh, when expanding uh, a standard elimination tree, so each of these super nodes is um, expanded and I also list not just the super node but all the entries, non-zero entries in that column as a first row, then this is exactly a, a click tree. So the bottom rows give are just the super nodal elimination tree. Each top row is adds to it the other entries in the uh, column. So this maximal supernodal elimination tree actually when expanded gives us a click tree. And then maybe the last thing to um, mention is that uh, for this part, if we, uh, after all this pre-processing of the elimination tree or supernodal elimination tree, we can actually uh, modify the ordering um, without any um, extra work and bring the pattern in a very nice form like this that we'll use and uh, assume when discussing uh, the algorithms in the next uh, lecture. So here, I, uh, after all this pre-processing of the elimination tree, I rearranged the ordering like this. So the diagonal blocks in this pattern these dense diagonal blocks are called the supernodes, maximal supernodes. They define dense uh, diagonal blocks in the pattern. And then uh, the other columns, the rest of the non-zeros in each uh, column defined by, um, block column defined by a supernode have the same uh, non-zero structure. So they uh, so that can be achieved uh, very efficiently and um, for a uh, coral um, sparsity pattern. And it's a very convenient um, form to start and, and discuss uh, sparse matrix algorithms. So here we actually treat every super node as uh, or more or less like a node in a standard elimination tree, but it's a block column of columns that have a very, uh, an identical, almost identical structure. I think I should stop here, uh, probably. Um, there's one topic left in this first part, but it's very closely related to the uh, Scholesky factorization and then the topic of the next lecture. So this uh, is probably a good time to stop for today. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Levin.
So anybody have some questions? Just one brief one. Um, it, it's more on matrix completion than uh, chordal graphs, but um, if you uh, are actually completing a matrix, uh, do you use software to do that? Do you, we, what do you recommend? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the um, in um, some of the uh, applications I'll discuss later, we uh, have our. Uh, package that we wrote with some Python code for uh, manipulating um, sparse matrices and uh, solving different types of completion problems. Um, some of those basic uh, pre-processing results that I mentioned you know, are available in MATLAB or other packages as so you can find the elimination tree and uh, uh, for a sparse matrix. Great, thanks. So a lot of these completions are for semi-definite completions. Are there some yeah. other quality? Um, yeah, so the quality type, of matrices that you would use for completion? Yeah, so the types we'll discuss are uh, post the semi-definite and the Euclidean distance matrix completion. So in the, the next uh, uh, second lecture, so those are the types of completion problems we'll uh, discuss and uh, use. Uh, of course, sparse matrix completion is also um, many other types of completion. For example, the minimum rank completion of a general sparse uh, rectangular matrix is uh, very important much more difficult than the types we'll uh, discuss here. So in terms of types of completion, you look at the post semi-definite completion. Um, actually two types, the maximum determinant post semi-definite completion, and also the minimum rank post semi-definite completion. And then for Euclidean distance also, we can look at the uh, minimum distance matrix completion with minimum dimension, or just a feasible Euclidean distance matrix completion or a completion in the, uh, with the minimum di dimension for coral graphs. So for general minimum rank completion? The general minimum look rank at completion. For using nuclear norm? Yes, for a non-symmetric case. Um, but it's not something I will discuss in the, these lectures. So that's a very common technique. But for coral grass and symmetric matrices, the minimum rank positive semi definite completion is actually easy to determine, as we'll see. Um, sorry, I have a, a very um, elementary question. Uh, it, was, it was just at the very start, uh, you said something which has kind of uh, uh, piqued my interest. So I, I, I'm totally new to chordal graphs. So chordal graphs are ones where the uh, minimal, you said the minimal uh, minimal separator, minimal vertex separators are, are complete graphs, yeah? Yes. Yeah, so for, for so just to be clear, I, this confused me for a while by, by I, so I, I misread this to mean the 
separators of minimal size, but it's actually the minimal. Yeah, so there's a, um, something in the definition. So minimal applies to the whole thing, right? It's a minimal separator for two given. That's why sort of this example is sort of uh, motivated by this. So X, Y is a minimal separator between A and C. Oh. But Y by itself can also be a minimal separator between for two different nodes. So it's not minimal. So yeah, so, so minimal. A, uh, sorry, minimal means minimal with respect to inclusion rather than minimal size there. The, uh, yeah, it's minimal with respect to inclusion and also for a, a specified pair of uh, vertices that you separate, right? Yeah, no, it, it, I was just interested in this because for a different reason, I've, with other people I've been looking at uh, graphs where the, the, say, graphs of a certain vertex connectivity where the uh, vertex separators of minimal size are all are complete graphs. But I guess that's a, a, a different concept. Together, I, I, I don't know. So I was, I was, uh, yeah, it's minimum I, I to uh, inclusion here, not minimum uh, of size. Yeah, that's right. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So when you talk, when, when you will be talking about completions, mm -hmm. will you discuss? discuss anything beyond, uh, well, I see you're taking advantage of sparsity. But what, what about also the difficulty of the problem? Is there anything hiding in, in the uh, sort of hiding condition numbers in the problem? Like certain graphs, even though you can express them as a completion problem, will be harder numerically to solve them than others, just from some hidden structure. Numerically, I mean. Yeah, we I won't really discuss this, but there are many interesting questions like this, right? So we'll um, use chordal graphs, but chordal graphs will appear as an extension, right? We start with a graph that's just general, that's not necessarily chordal, then we'll use a chordal extension. And then there's an, um, um, a question of how, you have a chordal uh, cycle, but I think the difficulty of the problem depends also on the length of this cycle. So if, um, you have more efficient chordal extensions than uh, other chordal extensions. Um, mm -hmm. like for example, what if you didn't know that the graph was almost rigid or even rigid? If yeah. it was hiding that it was rigid, would would you would your would it be hiding the fact that numerically it's more stable? You get a more accurate solution. Yeah, I don't know. It's very... yeah, I don't know actually. Uh. So is a is a triangular this graph uh, called a chordal graph? Triangulated is sort of a different uh, another name for chordal graphs yeah, from. Uh, ah. Triangulated as it's uh, used in some of these uh, is more common in the early literature. Uh, But in those papers, it's just uh, another term for chordal graph. Okay, thank you.